Hi, I'm uh, Lisa Minogue-White. I'm Regional Director at Plural Site, Head of uh, UK, France and Southern Europe. Delighted to have one of our strategic customers here today. And lovely to hear from Nick, because in a former life, I was Knowledge Advisor to Orange Fraud and Revenue Assurance Communities. Orange Group, so uh, it's lovely to hear that still kind of live and kicking. Um, but we're here today to hear from Sage, who are doing some really incredibly progressive things in cybersecurity. But what I wanted to take you through just quickly, just to sort of start off, is really a kind of a state of the nation. And some of the challenges that I imagine everybody in the room is facing, and some of the opportunities that you've got in 2023. So there's some good news here as well. Um, Gartner, good old, our good old friends at Gartner predicting an IT spend of 4.5 trillion in 2023. And of course, more IT spend means more infrastructure, more things to potentially be attacked. So that's all good fun. Um, Gartner's also found that 50% of enterprise IT organizations' migration to the cloud will be delayed by two years or more. So any mathematicians in the room here will probably have to start to realize what kind of costs will be incurred by that slowing down. And then, according to McKinsey, uh, 10.5 trillion globally monetary damages from cyber attacks. We all already heard from Nick about the impact on something like InterServe, so we know how uh, important these things are, and it simply is something that you just can't afford to ignore. And let's zoom in on cloud transformation, because a lot of this is the fact, and, and Sophia's going to tell you a little bit more about Sage, and obviously lots of organizations that you work with moving to online. Lots of organizations that people here very used to cloud, cloud native, but some smaller organizations, this is a big shift for them. And our state of the cloud survey that we ran, it surveyed 1,000 leaders and technologists in the, in the space. And on average, 75% of leaders are building new products and features in the cloud. I don't think there's any surprise there, about a 75%. But just to fly through this a little bit, according to Gartner, 75% of organizations are deliberately adopting multi-cloud strategies. And part of that, obviously, is to spread risk. So multi-cloud, by default, is the new state of being for organizations, but that makes infrastructure more uh, complex, and it makes cyber even more important. And it's not to exactly not to underestimate that type of complexity. And we need people like Sophia that you're going to hear from now to help us navigate this because this is a reality that Sage will experience as well. So, Sophia, this is all about you. So well, you've got a very impressive background, but it'd be great to introduce some of your experience, but I think in particular your current role, because I think that'll be of real interest to everybody in the team in terms of how seriously Sage takes cybersecurity. Thanks, Lisa. I really appreciate that. It's very generous. Um, I, hi, everyone. I'm Sophia Adamy. I'm the Director of Cybersecurity Awareness and Engagement at SAGE. I have over a decade of experience in the civil service before I moved to SAGE a few years ago. And I've been in my current role for about six months. What's interesting about my role is that it's not really that common. And I think it kind of signifies to a lot of the points that people have been talking about here today, the kind of focus on human-centered security, the need for culture to support our technical programs and how we can actually deliver across complex organizations to achieve security change. So it's kind of one of those things that SAGE has made a commitment to by putting investment behind this rather than just talking about it, actually. And I think, you know, so many breaches, I think it was 82% in the latest Verizon report indicates that there's a kind of human element to those. So kind of my role is really, really focused on how we can enmesh security into the DNA of an organization. You know, we're not here to influence, we're here to define it and make sure that it's a board priority as I think the previous speaker just mentioned. Absolutely, and you can see from the organizational chart that's behind us just how seriously Sage take this and, say, and take a role that Sophia fulfills with the organization. So a little bit of pressure on you, but you can cope with that, can't you, Sophia? I think it just is interesting to point to the fact that there's a, there's a kind of um, history in the cybersecurity industry about there being a hierarchy of knowledge, about what's more valued, about what's more important. You can be incredibly technically competent. You can have the most high-performing engineering team. If you cannot work with your IT team, if you do not have the confidence of your CFO, you really can't deliver the solutions that you need. So it's really about having that holistic approach. Absolutely, and I, I think a lot of the um, talks that you've heard today are talking about the breadth and depth of cybersecurity issues. There's so much that we can dive into, and it affects all aspects of business. But I think the most valuable thing is actually being uh, hearing about 
things like the um, BAM and InterServe story, how this actually plays out in context. So what I really want today, Sophie, is for people to hear a little bit more about the SAGE story. So can you kind of give us some context on the importance of cyber at SAGE? Sure, thank you. So SAGE, for anyone who doesn't know, is um, a software business and we provide accounting and financial software for kind of millions of customers around around the globe, mainly small, medium-sized businesses, small business owners, particularly in the UK. And the job of our cybersecurity team is to protect, you know, all those products and customer-facing services and all our IT enterprise structure, everything that we run the business on, essentially. And over the past kind of three, four years, we've been on a real security journey. We didn't have a security function. It was very federated in a very complex, huge global organization with 11,000 colleagues about two and a half thousand developers who are used to doing kind of what they wanted as it were and um, it's been a real real challenge and what we've really tried to do over the past kind of four four five years really is kind of build and make sure that we empower our colleagues all our colleagues regardless of which teams they're in when it comes to security and make security really really visible at the board level and all the way down so we m spend a lot of time doing that actually because it's just as important as some of the other work that we do um, and I think one of the key things that you mentioned there is really sort of democratizing, I guess, responsibility for security throughout the organization. So security champions, I know, is a, an important thing for you. So how did you approach it strategically? And what is the role that the Security Champions Network plays at SAGE? So I think I'm sure many people will know what security champions are, probably. Um, we have a great security champions network at SAGE, um, about 180 colleagues. You can see some details on here. We um, made a decision about two, three years ago to make a step change in how we approach them. As I mentioned, we have 11,000 colleagues, about 150 products, a global security team of about 60, 65 people. There's no way that we can have the coverage that we need just using those individuals. So in terms of delivering change, security change across the business, we kind of formalized the process and structure around security champions gave them a job description, engaged their managers, gave them resources, and really gave them a lot of training and really a lot of support and connection to the security team at the center. They dedicate three and a half hours, which is about 10% of their time each week to security, and they are essentially a force multiplier for us in the security team. And I think what's interesting about our security champions network, they're not just developers, they're kind of testers, architects, some non-technical roles actually in teams like finance where we have kind of high levels of risk. So it's quite a flexible approach, but all of it is really bringing them into the center and really making sure that they feel, you know, loved. There was that human talk earlier, I think, from Kevin about how you can really approach your colleagues in the business and we do the same for our security champions. I think one of the things that really resonated for me, and it's going sort of slightly off topic, but I think it was really important when we were discussing before we came into the presentation, is that democratizing of responsibility for security. And I think one of the things that you've done with the, with the Security Champions Network and also recognized and kind of given specific recognition is something that I've seen in organizations over the years is that you either apply a kind of a community approach where everybody is implicitly responsible for security, but you're not putting your money where your mouth is at a board level, or it's a top-down hierarchical approach, and neither quite meet. Whereas with Sage, you've been much more holistic about the way you've approached it. I'd say so, and I think, um, I think what's really interesting about security culture and culture in general is it really is a conversation about power and influence, and it is about how are you uh, reinforcing and supporting and rewarding the behaviors that you want to see, and how are you making sure that it is explicit? So if you anything that is not made clear or visible to colleagues in security terms, particularly for security champions, about what is valuable and what's important to you as a business, that's what you're tolerating. So you have to really make sure that you're explicit in how you reward and empower these colleagues to deliver security in their teams. Absolutely, and you know, there's lots of incredible technology that can support you, but I think that cultural piece, all those investments you make in technology can't be realized without investing in the, in the culture. And I think that kind of brings us nicely onto the partnership we have with Sage, because obviously Sage are, are a customer of Pluralsight. Can you provide us some insights into the upskilling programs that form part of this and the sort of results that you've seen? Yeah, great, I mean, we, we started um, this upskilling program uh, about two years ago as part of a broader security transformation program in our product security, for, for our products, to reduce product security risk. And we didn't actually know who the colleagues were that we needed to deliver this to. That's kind of the lack of visibility we had. We had a security training control. We knew we had to deliver it. Um, we had to really start from scratch. 
building out um, conversations, making sure that we engage with these colleagues. What we then created with, with a colleague who, who's in the audience here, we created a kind of monthly cadence to make sure um, that colleagues from our application security team were prescribing um, appropriate security training depending on the technology and the vulnerabilities that they were finding for the particular um, group or the particular team. And we really just focused on how to make sure that colleagues were having that iterative approach so we weren't delivering anything in a mandatory way. We were really trying to encourage and support and any kind of problems that we faced with kind of engagement that we sought that out at the managerial level rather than kind of burdened colleagues at the coalface. Um, we recently published a case study with Sage, and one of the reasons why we wanted to tell that story, I think, was the fact that Sage take a very dynamic approach to um, cybersecurity training. So often in organisations you see, like you say, mandatory programmes or things that are done at a point in time, or we must have a, a big push. Like after a major breach, right now it's all become really important and everybody must do that training. And it doesn't really talk to the fact that, you know, for SAGE, it's part of your DNA, isn't it? It's part of the way that you work. It's a part of the way that you do things. And because of that, it, it constantly changes. Yeah, and I think what we started to see was that we started to see real results. I think the partnership with Pluralsight worked well because it was based on trust and also because we started to see a real increase in proficiency within the security teams and we looked at the kind of capability um, holistically and there was a huge drop in the time it took to fix security vulnerabilities. It was an 82% drop and it showed that developers were writing less new vulnerabilities into the code but actually the main point was they were having more time to go back and fix the old ones and that we can't attribute that directly to training we'd love to make that claim it would make us feel very good about ourselves but actually it was really that holistic approach where we were using the application security team kind of partnership with Pluralsight and our senior sponsorship to make sure that we kind of had the approach that we needed to support those developers wonderful so moving on to the future so how are you going to continue to embed kind of continuous learning into the cybersecurity culture at Sage and what's next so I think we have over, we have a lot of products, more than 40, so it's highly likely that we'll probably have to deliver this program to more products and kind of continue to scale. I think the thing that we have learned is that that continuous improvement approach is a real fertile kind of um, position of security as an industry in general, which you can really use to leverage security training and learning capability. And I think what we would like to do is just work out how we can best serve our colleagues and continue to empower them. What we found is that through the training, um, when we were kind of looking and pulling some of the data from Pluralsight, we saw that colleagues were doing their security training and then they were actually, oh, I'll have a look at this, I'll have a look at that. They were exploring security and becoming interested. So I think what we're trying to cultivate is that curiosity with security and that support from the security team to indulge that. Obviously, we understand that developers have very kind of strict time management. They can't be burdened with loads and loads of training. However, that it's really a tool for us to influence culture as part of our kind of wider comms and engagement programs. Fantastic. And I know we may have a little bit of time for a couple of questions, but I'm going to be exceptionally rude and I'm going to monopolise your time by me asking the question. In fact, I don't think we have got much time. So I will ask the question because I think it's a good one for everybody here just to round off. What would be your top pieces of advice for anybody here wanting to embed that kind of cultural shift and bring, kind of marry the technology solutions the ways of working and culture into creating something a lot more holistic like you've done at Sage? Um, I mean, I definitely don't think we've cracked it, but I think the approach that we have taken is to really think about who your key stakeholders are, and it might not actually be the people you think it is, and the, the main people that you really need to convince are your board and your senior sponsors, firstly and foremost, and then also you need to build that kind of ground level support by placing a kind of human first emphasis on security. So I think from my perspective, it's really about cultivating a clear narrative, making sure that you understand the why, why you're delivering this, conveying that consistently and making it visible across the business and making sure that you have really solid buy-in from your senior leaders and that you can work collaboratively across, across the business because not all technology problems need a technical solution. And I think that what we've seen in Sage is such a complex organization, which I'm sure is the same as many in here face, you, you actually need um, many people in the room to, to create the solutions. It's not just technical teams that should be your kind of first point of contact. 
Wonderful. And a huge thanks to Sophia and the whole team at Sage, because if you do want to dive any deeper into this story, because we really have only kind of like skimmed the surface of it, we have a webinar coming up in case study and there's lots for you to take away. Although, you know, I'm very proud to say that we helped with this program, actually the case study and the webinar are really much more about how an organisation really embeds uh, a true security culture. So, Sophia, thank you so much thank for you. speaking today. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.